Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello, I am Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. It is a teaching program, and we seek throughout this time together to draw closer to our God through the study of His Word. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It is such a day, a, such an awesome day that you have made. We do rejoice. We are glad in it. We are so thankful for all you do for us and for all you have done for us and all that you will still do for us. Your blessings are new every morning. And so we ask you, Heavenly Father, to anoint my tongue, to declare your word, and also to anoint our ears, our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, yesterday we finished the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus concludes with the tabernacle of the Lord having been set up and the cloud of God's presence resting above the tab tabernacle while the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. We began then the study of the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is a book of regulations of the community of Israel. The Ten Commandments most certainly were the most important to the people, but the book of Leviticus further ordered the people's daily affairs. The Levitical laws are indeed elaborate, and they needed to be continually satisfied through sacrifice. Though there were various offerings such as the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, the fellowship offerings, the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings, one time each year the priest would make atonement for his sins, his family's sins, and the sins of all Israel. He also went about to cleanse God's holy dwelling place, the tabernacle itself, and the holy things associated with it. Everything that was associated with Israel needed to be atoned for. Anything that God would come in contact with that needed to be atoned for because throughout the year, because of the people's sinfulness, it would have been it would have been defiled. Okay? And so the instructions for the Day of Atonement are found in Leviticus chapter 16. They are so very important to the life of the Israelites. I am going to read the chapter fully and then make some extensive comments about it. So this is Leviticus chapter 16. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments. So he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering 
to make atonement for himself and his household. And he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two hands full of ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the tablets of the covenant law so that he won't die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and with his fingers sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he is to sprinkle some of it with his fingers seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his whole household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from an uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and the rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it in the wilderness. Then Aaron is to go into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place, and he is to leave them there. He shall bathe himself with water in the sanctuary area and put on his regular garments. Then he shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself and the burnt offering for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. He shall also burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may come into the camp. The bull and the goat for the sin offerings, whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement, must be taken outside the camp. Their hides, flesh, and intestines are to be burned up. The man who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may come into the camp. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you on the tenth day of the seventh month. You must deny yourself and not do any work, whether native-born or a foreigner residing among you, because on this day atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then before the Lord you will be clean from all your sins. It is a day of Sabbath rest, and you must deny yourself. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the members of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, what did it all mean? What did all of this that was being done accomplish for God's people? Well, I pulled some excerpts on the atonement from a man by the name of Bob Diefenbach. He says, you know, the priestly clothing which Aaron was to wear on this one occasion was very different than that which he normally wore in the course of his duties. On every other day, Aaron wore beautiful clothes colored materials, intricate embroidery, gold and jewelry which made him look like a king. On the Day of Atonement he looked more like a slave. His outfit consisted of four simple garments in white linen. 
even plainer than the vestments of the ordinary priests. On this one day, the high priest enters the other world into the very presence of God, and he must dress, therefore, as befits the occasion. Among his fellow men, he, his dignity as the great mediator between man and God is unsurpassed, and his splendid clothes draws attention to the glory of his office. But in the presence of God, even the high priest is stripped of all honor. He becomes simply the servant of the king of kings. Now the ceremony of Aaron's offering, the bull for his sins and his family, he has done this also earlier in Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 4, but in both offerings a bull is sacrificed, and in the same way. But in the blood of the bull that is discussed in chapter 4 of Leviticus, the bull's blood is only sprinkled on the horns of the altar. But in chapter 16, the blood is also sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, another thing that's unique here is the sin offering for the people is both unique and compound. There's no other sacrifice quite like it. It involves both an animal that will live and an animal that will die. The goat, which was the Lord's, was sacrificed for the sins of the people. Like the bull and the blood, it was applied in the same ways. The fate of the goat which lived, that goat was to carry the sins of the people on its body, away from the camp, away from where the Israelites were, and out into the wilderness. It was never, ever to return. But what if it did return? Would that mean that Israel's sins were returning to them? No Israelite would want that. The whole point of this being is that the possibility of these goats coming back to the camp is just one more indication that this Day of Atonement wasn't permanent. There was a tentativeness to it. It wasn't lasting. The Day of Atonement was not only for cleansing the people, it was also cleansing for the place. You know, it's really, really emphatic in this particular chapter that the Day of the Atonement was provided by God to cleanse his holy dwelling place, the tabernacle, and the things associated with it. You know, throughout the year, the, the tabernacle of God was in the midst of God's people, but God's people were sinners. And so God's tabernacle and the holy things would become defiled over the past year due to the sins of the people and the priests. And so the priests were to make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And so he would do for the tent of meeting that atonement because it was among the people of Israel. What was actually at stake in all of this was this, was whether or not God would continue to live within the camp in the midst of his people. The uncleanness of the people contaminated the dwelling place of God and the day of atonement was provided to remove these sins. The most dreaded evil for Israel would have been if God would have chosen to leave their presence. As I've mentioned already, though, as wonderful as the Day of Atonement was, it brought no permanent solution for the sins of God's people. A better sacrifice was needed. Well, like the feasts, the spring feast and the fall feast, which God established for his people to observe year after year as a dress rehearsal for the promised Messiah, so also was the Day of Atonement, a foreshadowing of a better sacrifice, one that would bring a permanent cleansing of God's people and of his dwelling place. The New Testament, particularly the book of Hebrews, stresses the superiority of the death of Jesus. Unlike the priests in the Old Testament who had to offer up a sacrifice for themselves because of their own sin, Jesus needed no such thing. As the scriptures put it, for it was fitting 
that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who did not need daily, like the high priest, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son, Jesus, made perfect forever. Furthermore, Aaron died, but Christ lives forever. He lived, he died, and he rose again. And so Christ is vastly superior to Aaron and to every single one of the high priests that Israel ever had. The place of Christ's ministry is also superior to the place of Aaron's ministry. Aaron ministered in a small earthly sanctuary, entering into the Holy of Holies, but just once a year. On top of that, the people could never enter into this privileged place. Christ tabernacled among us in his flesh during his earthly ministry. That's what the Apostle John said in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, that Jesus came and he dwelled among us. He tabernacled among us. He tented among us. That's what the word tabernacle means. Jesus came. He tented among us. He tabernacled among us in his flesh during his earthly ministry. And then after he offered himself once for all, he entered into the heavenly sanctuary. The sanctuary of Christ was superior to those offered by Aaron. Aaron and all the other priests could but offer the blood of bulls and goats, but Christ offered his own precious blood. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, a tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption, lasting redemption. The superiority of Christ's one sacrifice to that of Aaron's many offerings is also seen in the fact that the results of Christ's sacrifice are greater. The best that one could hope for with the sacrifices done on the Day of Atonement was that the impurity of the sin would be put off for another year. Christ's death puts away sin altogether. Aaron's offerings could only produce forbearance. Christ's offering brought forgiveness. The last aspect of the, the superiority of Christ's atonement to Aaron which we're going to consider here, is that Christ's sacrifice brought better access to God. Aaron himself could only draw near to God, that is, to the Holy of Holies, but once a year. The people could not ever come that near. But when Jesus, our Lord, was crucified and his blood was shed for the sins of the world, that veil which formerly kept people apart from God was torn asunder signifying that every single believer has full and unlimited access to God. And so the, the writer of the Hebrews says, Therefore, since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from a conscience, an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Jesus suffered and died once and for all. After he finished his work of salvation and redemption, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. He lives to this day. That part of salvation, that part of redemption of Jesus' work is done. Now, surely Jesus continues to work. We are told that he continually makes intercession for us. But the work of salvation, the sacrifice which brought the cleansing of sin, is finished forever. That simply could never have been said of the Levitical laws and the priesthood. The priests served God's people continually, bringing before the Lord the sacrifices of the people. 
Day in and day out, day after day, the priest did their work. They could never say their work was finished. What God has done for the entire world through the life, death, and resurrection of his son is precious and it is wonderful. But like the Israelites of old, we run the risk of becoming so familiar with what God has done for us that we take it for granted and we don't honor God as we should with our lives. How we live matters to God because it is the best indicator to the watching world that God matters to us. Let me say that again. How we live matters to God because it is the best indicator to the watching world that God matters to us. Following the instructions on the Day of Atonement, or for the Day of Atonement, the Lord gave Moses some additional laws and regulations. In Leviticus chapter 17, the Lord, through Moses, commanded the Israelites not to make sacrifices anywhere except at the tabernacle. Just at the tabernacle. And also, hunters were to drain the blood of the animals they killed onto the earth and cover the blood with earth. They were not ever to eat the blood of any creature because the life of the creature is in its blood. Chapter 17 is all about that. Now, in Leviticus 18, the Lord tells Moses to speak to the Israelites about sexual relations that they were not to have. Now, why did the Lord forbid these particular sexual relations, which I'm about to read? You see, he gave the regulations, he forbid these kind of sexual relations because the Israelites were not to be like the people of Egypt, where God's people used to live, and they were not to become like the people of Canaan, where the Lord was going to be bringing them. The Israelites were to be a holy people, They were to be different than the people around them. They were not to engage in the lewd practices of other people. For it was because of the lewd practices of the Egyptians and the Canaanites that brought God's judgment upon them. Lewd practices which primarily were the result of the worship of idols. Having said all this, let's let's hear what Leviticus chapter 18 says. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and carefully follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same house or elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. That would dishonor you. Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife, born to your father. She is your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. She is your father's close relative. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister because she is your mother's close relative. Do not dishonor your father's brother by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. She is your aunt. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. Do not have sexual relations with a woman and her daughter. Do not have sexual relations with either her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are her close relatives. That is wickedness. Do not take your wife's sister as a, as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanness of her monthly period. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself by her. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for that would be, for you must not profane the name of the Lord, your God. I am the Lord. 
do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, that is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion. Do not defile yourself in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled. So I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native-born and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things, for all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their people. Keep my regulations and do not follow any of the detestable practices and customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. Did anyone or did everyone hear that sexual sins defile or corrupt or pollute not only the nations who participate in them but the land as well? We don't like to think that our sins, the sins we commit, have any effect on anyone other than ourselves and maybe the one that has been joined to us in our sin. But that's simply not true. Our sins have far-reaching effects, even to the point of defiling, polluting, corrupting the earth itself. Notice also that the Lord was holding accountable the nations that did not have a special relationship with him as Israel did. He was holding them accountable for their sins, just as he would for Israel. None of the nations could say, well, we don't belong to the Lord, so his regulations don't apply to us. Not true. It wasn't true in the days of Moses, nor is it true today. All nations, all people are accountable to God. All nations, all people will be held responsible for their sins. It is most certainly true that Jesus died so that our sins would be forgiven, but Jesus did not die so that we could go on sinning as we've always sinned. The forgiveness God gives us through Jesus Christ was costly, and so let us and so let, let the cost of what God was willing to pay for our forgiveness affect the way we live. Let's live to honor God with every ounce of our being, including our sexuality. Let me just bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for joining, Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.